AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power. So how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud. Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of a variable regional pricing. And of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash automate. That's oracle.com slash automate. oracle.com slash automate. Good afternoon. Let's talk some business here. We are doing it live and doing more at four weekday afternoons. We get right down to business with the News Driven Hour right after Ben Shapiro and just before the 790 KBC News Blitz with Randy Wang at five. Yep, Motec on Money live on the air here in 790 KBC, streaming live online worldwide at KBC.com and the on demand Motec on Money podcast, KBC.com, Apple iTunes, and all your favorite podcast platforms. Well, stocks closing higher today. It turns out we have the best. Advance for a week since last November, coming off that nervous week uh, last week. Strong retail sales reports uh, this week, helping to offset uh, some of the worries about potential weakness in the U.S. economy and ease some of the recession talk we were hearing uh, a week ago. The rally also uh, occurred as we await the comments from Fed Chairman Jerome Powell, who will be speaking at next week's economic summit in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, with the uh, Fed uh, officials there. The Dow coming in for a closing gain today of 97 points to settle at 40,660. The S&P 500 moved up 11 points to 2,500, make that 5,554. The Nasdaq gained 37 points, finishing at 17,632. For the week, the Dow was up 2.9%. The S&P 500 tacked on 3.9%, and the Nasdaq jumped 5.3%. Looks like both the Dow and the S&P 500 now less than 2% from their previous record highs. Also giving the market a boost today, the latest reading on consumer confidence, the University of Michigan's latest consumer confidence reading rose in the month of August, coming in a bit better than expected. Not all rainbows and ice cream cones, though. Construction of new homes down nearly 7% in July, down 6.8% compared with the previous month as builders scaled back new projects. Mortgage rates also inched up slightly this past week, but were far lower than where they were a year ago. According to the latest survey from mortgage giant Freddie Mac this week, the average 30-year fixed now at 6.49%. The magnificent one, NVIDIA, roaring back this week. Uh, the stock closed up $1.72 today to one twenty four fifty eight. You may recall it cracked below 100 during that washout last week. NVIDIA bulls coming back with a vengeance this week. B. Riley Financial. Based here in Los Angeles, the stock rallying 26% today after Brian R. Riley, the founder, chairman, and co-chief executive and largest shareholder of that investment bank, made an offer to buy the stock he does not already own for $7 a share. That's about a 40% premium over the stock's closing price yesterday of $5.04. The stock was trading at about $50 a year ago. Gold also shining today, hitting record highs. This is a big story. The price of gold settling up today. In a big way, up more than $53 to $2,546.20 an ounce. That is the 28th all-time settlement high so far this year for the yellow metal. Price of oil pulling back today about um, demand, worries about demand prevailing, despite the nervousness happening in the Middle East and Israel still under the threat of an attack by Iran. We saw crude oil futures down $1.51 today to $76.65 a barrel. Nearly 3 million records of names, birth dates, and Social Security numbers have reportedly been compromised in a major breach of personal information, putting people at risk of identity theft and scams. A hacking group stole the records of nearly 3 billion people from the National Public Data, a background check company, according to a lawsuit earlier reported by Bloomberg. According to the report, the breach occurred in April and includes full names, current and past addresses, Social Security numbers, and so forth. I'll discuss this latest breach with Michael Broomer, the vice president and head of Experian Global Data Breach Resolution. 
New concerns about the nation's growing debt bomb. Today is the anniversary of the so-called Inflation Reduction Act. Today, Elon Musk tweeted or X'd out on his X, formerly known as Twitter platform. Inflation is caused by the federal government spending more than it earns because they just print more money to make up the difference. To solve inflation, he wrote, reduce wasteful government spending. Your tax dollars should be spent well, not poorly. I'll talk about that with Kurt Couchman, Senior Fiscal Policy Fellow at Americans for Prosperity. But first... On your money, the markets, the economy, and the whole works now. Joining us live, Jonathan Honig, Fox News contributor, Fox Business contributor, portfolio manager at Capitalist Pig Hedge Fund, and author of the book Prices Primary, How to Profit with Any Asset in Any Market at Any Time. Jonathan Honig, thank you very much for coming to the line this afternoon. Frank, great to be with you. And wow, you you have to just marvel at a tremendous snap back in the last week for stocks, especially for technology stocks, as you said, I mean, up 5% in just a week, a really impressive performance. What stands out to me, probably most interestingly of, of all the news you just mentioned, is the fact that at the same time the federal government is growing about the reduction in inflation, you have gold, probably the best harbinger and indicator of inflation, hitting that new all-time high. So, I think there are some places to make money in this market, but I still contend that the best opportunities are going to be in those off-the-radar screen ideas, not the NVIDIAs, not the Microsofts, not those well-known names, but the alternative ideas like gold that are doing well but not getting the, the, the discussion and the herd that they probably will. On the air live with Jonathan Honig, also on X, by the way, in a big way. So uh, check him out on uh, social media and always appreciate the uh, fantastic social media support you give uh, to this program here, uh, Jonathan. Uh, let me ask you about gold here. Uh, and as as you've noted and we've noted here on this program, it's kind of curious that gold will be hitting record highs just at a time when we're told uh, inflation is uh, supposedly cooling. Of course, uh, it's already seen a, a tremendous run up uh, up to this point here. But uh, where do you see gold go from here? Well, you know, all-time high for most people, Frank, is uh, it's it's frightening to you know consider buying something at an all-time high. We always think to ourselves, well, it's at its all-time high, and how can it go any higher? But as you mentioned, when gold has had some twenty odd all-time highs in just the past year, and that is the nature of a bull market. Bull markets tend to persist, especially in commodities like gold. And the last big bull market for gold unfolded over the period of 10 years. It was you know, basically 2001 through 2010 or 2011. The old adage, Frank, is that a good, uh, an ounce of gold should cost about as much as a very high quality uh, custom bespoke suit. So it's not too hard to imagine that before this bull market is over, you could see a price of ounce of uh, an ounce of gold be 3,000, 3,500, even 4,000, implying quite a bit of room to run from here. One thing I haven't seen uh, in this gold run up is a bunch of stores opening. Uh, we buy gold. You know, remember uh, in previous uh, bull runs for gold, we, we see those uh, shops uh, uh, coming up in a big way, but maybe because uh, rents are so expensive, we're, we're not seeing those uh, stores uh, so much anymore. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think that's a very astute observation, Frank. And what you're not seeing, and look, everyone has to consult with his or her own financial advisors, do your own due diligence, and always uh, focus on a diversified portfolio. But in my opinion, you're just not seeing exactly, as you said, that mass public interest in hysteria, either in selling or in buying gold. You know, uh, the the cabbie, if you will, the, the cab driver is still more likely, in my opinion, to be asking about cryptocurrency or NVIDIA than they are about gold. But, you know, as, as I wrote about in my book, Price is Primary, Price is Everything. It's all about price, and that all-time high, more than anything else, suggests even more more all-time highs are set to come. Excellent point. We're on the year live with Jonathan Honig. And speaking of cryptos, uh, I know you, you don't have the, the laser eyes on. We talked to the biggest fans here as well as the, the harshest critics, but we all uh, keep an eye on it. Uh, Bitcoin's been all over the place so right now below 60K here, uh, around 59,163. And and we've seen wild gyrations uh, in that world. Uh, what about uh, cryptos and uh, your observations there? Well, you're right, Frank. I mean, it's it's an asset class that obviously is a tremendous volatility and one that is increasingly weak. If you really kind of look underneath the surface a little bit, two of the big crypto miners that I follow are Riot Platforms, that's R-I-O-T, R-I-O-T, and a stock that goes, the ticker symbol is Mara, that's Marathon Digital. They're both down anywhere from 
35 to 40 percent in just the last month. Now, Bitcoin hasn't dropped that much, but oftentimes, Frank, the stocks can be leading indicator for the cryptocurrency itself. So, you know, it's time like this. I think you really need to test yourself if you are that long term uh, holder. But the fact that the Bitcoin miners are so weak, I think, gives me a lot of pause in terms of buying Bitcoin at these levels. All right. So do you like uh, analog gold over uh, virtual gold? <laughs> I, I think indeed in the market, you know, you can't argue with the tape and the fact that gold and silver and the ways to play that are GLD and SLV and, and, and some supportive evidence as well, Frank. I mean, the Canadian stock market, ticker symbol on that one is EWC. It hit a 52-week high today. You're seeing ETFs in South Africa, for example, a lot of the commodity-related countries and markets that take off. So, you know, we always say you have to kind of go where the action is. And right now, it's much more, in my opinion, in the precious metals than it is in digital currency. All right. What about silver, which is still, uh, well, it's certainly up for the year. That's for sure. It's up uh, 68 cents today at $29.50. Uh, where do you see silver go from here? Rising tide lifts all boats. Gold and silver are extraordinarily coordinated, excuse me, uh, uh, correlated. The difference is, you know, Frank, if you're hesitant to buy an asset like gold at its all-time high, Silver still isn't there. I mean, SLV, that's the ETF that tracks the price of silver. It's trading at about 28. Well, it was trading over 40 just back in, uh, in 2011. So with silver is uh, still well off of its 52-week high. But you know, if history is any guide, as we said, a rising tide tends to lift all boats. So silver, gold, platinum, and palladium. And in fact, Frank, there's a ticker uh, and an ETF that you might consider that tracks all of these precious metals. It's GLTR, like glitter, GLTR. It's a basket of gold, silver, platinum, uh, palladium. Again, one part of your portfolio, not the whole uh, shebang, but you want to go where the action is. You want to go which sectors are leading, and precious metals are leading right now in a big way. And kudos to the person that came up with that the ticker symbol. That is very clever. All right. And <laughs> and uh, one thing that got attention this week, uh, in fact, it started last week, right? Ulta Beauty um, looks like Warren Buffett uh, got into it in a big way. Uh, and that stock has seen a, a big run uh, this week. Yeah, there's there's certainly opportunities, Frank. I mean, I, I right now it makes me think very much like that period from 2001 to 2010 or 11, basically in effect when the large cap stocks were dormant and it was the small caps, the value, the international. You know, one of the things we've seen since that uh, horrendous, uh, horrendous jobs report was a real has been a real weakening of the U.S. dollar, and not to mention an outperformance of some of those value stocks. So, you know, Buffett is a snooping around, he's looking for value, and I think it's a it's a good opportunity for everyday investors as well. You know, we've talked about some of the tobacco stocks, for example. Uh, BTI is one that I like in that space. Not sexy. It's not flashy. It's not transistors and semiconductors. You know, it's just plain old cigarettes. But that stock's up about 15% in just the last month. And again, not on everyone's lips or in everyone's portfolios like crypto and, and the, the uh, MAG7. All right. And speaking of the MAG-7, I know you uh, were very cautious and uh, we did have that washout last week and the MAG-7 names with even NVIDIA below 100. Now it's back up to uh, almost 125. Um, have, have you changed your views at all on, on that uh, group that led the, the big rally? I mean, think about that, Frank, a 25 percent. Uh, appreciation in the most valuable company, one of the top two or three value most valuable companies in the, on the planet in just a matter of the week. Uh, you know, as investors, in my opinion, you want to be looking for what's next, what's the next big thing, and nothing against these tremendous companies, but, you know, if, if you're asking yourself where are valuations going to be expanding, you know, I'd much rather play something like global healthcare. A ticker symbol on that one is IXJ. You know, you saw a Novartis today hitting new 52 week high or even real estate, Frank, you know, much to my surprise. And I think the market surprises REITs continue to do well. So RWX is one I like. That's an international real estate fund. And again, this is not the kind of assets going to jump 5% in one day, but over the next, you know, year, 18 months, I think some of these less followed areas are going to make investors quite a bit of money. On the air live with Jonathan Honig, and uh, from experience, uh, you probably, I uh, think, have noted that uh, when interest rates go up, those REITs uh, fall out of favor, right? But uh, now the expectation is the Fed will be cutting rates soon. So uh, do they appear more attractive here? These are the ones that usually have those attractive uh, dividend yields as well. Indeed, Frank. And in fact, you know, we're seeing a lot of the 
interest rate sensitive stocks do very well. Utilities, XLU, that's the ETF that tracks utilities. It's not too far from its 52 week high. And preferred stocks, you know, for investors who perhaps want to diversify even beyond stocks and bonds, preferred stocks, great income opportunity, and PSFR is a REIT preferred ETF that I like. Again, you always want to think about diversification, spreading it around. So, you know, if you're on a fixed income and, you know, lamenting the fact that you can't get to 5% in cash anymore because rates are coming down, PFFR is one to consider. Again, it is volatile. It's not the same as a bank account, but I think these are the types of under the radar screen ideas where you're going to make some money in the weeks and months to come. All right, we've been seeing these high-profile uh, commercial real estate deals. Uh, some people taking huge uh, haircuts on on some of the the uh, the prices uh, that they went for and, and being sold uh, at, at huge uh, discounts on commercial real estate. Uh, have things bottomed out? You think? And uh, what about uh, the impact of, of this uh, commercial real estate uh, meltdown we continue to see? Well, I think that that's what's pretty interesting and kind of a, a, a real difference in at least what's happening in the physical brick and mortar real estate world, Frank, and you know what's happening in the, in, in the financial markets. I mean, Simon Property Group, for example, it's one of the largest REITs in the world. It's up by about 9% year to date. It's not even including a 5% dividend. And over the last year, Simon Property is up 35%. That is the, the price of its stock. So, you know, again, my theory is the market always leads. So what you're seeing in the physical market, that is those uh, markdowns, that actually might be backward looking. You know, we might be finally looking, you know, at uh, you know, maybe some growth opportunities in real estate, uh, given the fact that so many of the stocks are breaking out to new 52-week highs. All right. We've got nervous time in the Middle East. Oil, uh, curiously, ha has pulled back um, in the face of, of all of this now. And and um, mercifully, uh, gas prices have eased off, and that's probably the main reason why we've seen uh, consumer confidence tick slightly higher this month, according to that reading that we got today. Uh, what about oil here? Well, the one I like is it kind of plays into the, again, the dividend uh, play, if you will, Frank. And it's, it's a big uh, oil stock, ExxonMobil, but kind of an unusual way to play it. It's an ETF from a firm by the name of YieldMax, Ticker symbol is XOMO. That's XOMO. Basically, this is a fund that owns ExxonMobil and then writes call options on ExxonMobil. Basically, a dividend option strategy. Frank, it's got a yearly dividend distribution rate now of 23% for owning ExxonMobil. Now, yes, there's certainly uh, risk and the, the stock goes down and there's certainly plenty of risk with a security like this, but XOMO I think is one to consider as an alternative way and a high dividend way to play the oil patch. And in effect, even if oil stays where it is or even goes down, this is the kind of security that could make you money because of that extraordinarily high dividend. So XOMO, put it in your tool book, do your own due diligence, but put it on your list in terms of way, ways to play energy. That's very interesting. Is that a monthly dividend payer, by the way? Monthly dividend payer. Yield is over 23%. The firm is Yield Max. And uh, it's the type of situation, Frank, that if ExxonMobil stays right where it is, this will do extraordinarily well. If ExxonMobil takes off like a rocket, the call option strategies will underperform, but it gives you that you know solid ballast and solid base of over 23% in dividends at the same time that interest rates, as you said, are coming down. That's very interesting. Now, what about volatility? We had that huge week in volatility last week, and the uh, volatility um, index has, uh, has come down dramatically. Uh, would you be betting more on, on volatility uh, at this point? Well, you know, uh, they let you do that, Frank. I know, as you know, I mean, you, you can trade securities like VXX, which is literally an ETF of fear, of uh, betting, as you said, and higher or lower volatility. Um, you know, I think more than anything else, the best insulation from volatility is that strong, sound financial foundation that, unfortunately, so many Americans do not have. I mean, there's stats out in recent months that anywhere between 60 to 80 percent of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. We know that uh, credit card delinquencies are starting to, to catch up. So, you know, rather than, I think, uh, you know, betting on fear, now is a great opportunity to make sure those credit card debts are paid off. You have the, the emergency, the income uh, situation or the, uh, the emergency fund and, and some kind of a, a cash alternative in your account because uh, volatility is a given, Frank. It's not a matter of when, it's a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And I'm from a school that says we will retest some of those lows 
in the NASDAQ that just came a week, 10 days ago. So great opportunity on the rebound to finally get your house in order, financial house in order, and buckle up because volatility, given the Middle East, given the politics, it's not going away. Beautifully stated. Jonathan, thank you very much. Uh, we wish you a, a great weekend. Uh, break out the champagne, if not the champagne, at least the beer, maybe, uh, uh, celebrating this uh, recovery week. And uh, we've had a, the best week what, since last November, so uh, certainly uh, we want to celebrate in some fashion. Jonathan Honig, Fox News contributor, Fox Business contributor, portfolio manager at Capitalist Pig, hedge fund author of the book Price is Primary, How to Profit with Any Asset in Any Market at Any Time. Jonathan, thank you very much, and have a great weekend. Oh, stay cool. Thank you, Frank. Thank you very much, and let's get right out to the freeways now on this gorgeous Friday afternoon here in Southern California on 790 KBC. There's no way 790 KBC welcomes David Gilmore coming to the Intuit Dome on October 25th. Tickets are on sale now at Ticketmaster.com. Right now, caller 9 wins at 1-888-795-222. You get a pair of tickets to the show if you are caller number 9. Call right now. 1-888-790-5222. Tickets furnished by Live Nation. Another winner on Wall Street this week, and today the Dow up another nearly 100 points, closing up 97 at 40,659. The S&P 500 up 11 at 5,554, and the Nasdaq gained 37 at 17,632. The yield in the 10-year note now at 3.88%. We have seen a blip higher in that uh, yield, and that's the one that impacts the fixed rate mortgage rates, which have also moved slightly higher this week. Checking the cryptos now, Bitcoin down about 500 at 59,163. Ethereum down 8 at 2604. Doge at 10 cents. Gold, the star of the day, hitting a record high close, up nearly $54 at $2,546.20 an ounce. Silver, along for the ride today, up 68 cents at 29.50. NVIDIA. Big rebound this week of $1.72 back to $124.58. And now the latest news in 790 KBC. Motago Money continues here in 790 KBC. Good afternoon. Nearly 3 million records of names, birth dates, and Social Security numbers have all reportedly been compromised in a major breach of personal information, putting people at risk of identity theft and scams. This is a whopper here, a hacking group. Reportedly stole the records of nearly 3 billion people from the National Public Data Company. That's a background check company, according to a lawsuit reported by Bloomberg News. According to the report, the breach occurred earlier this year and includes full names, current and past addresses, Social Security numbers, information regarding relatives, and other personal information related to people living here in the U.S., Canada, and the United Kingdom. Joining us live now is Michael Broomer, Vice President and Head of Experian, Global Data Breach Resolution. Michael Broomer, thank you very much for taking the call this afternoon. Thanks for having me, Frank. What's your reaction to this uh, big news this week? Well, it is a big event, and anytime you have a billion behind any number of people that have gotten impacted, it draws attention. But I think there's a lot of hype, too, because between 2.9 billion records and 2.9 billion individuals that some reports are saying, it's a big difference. And we really don't know how many Social Security numbers for individuals have been compromised. Not to say it isn't important, but the reports have been way overblown. All right. I've already seen uh, some uh, stories, uh, even some sites that say, hey, you can check to see if your Social Security number is part of that. Is, is it risky to, to put your information into something like that, uh, to, to check to see uh, possibly if you're at risk, but then uh, putting yourself further at risk, possibly uh, giving your Social Security number to somebody else? Well, there are some sites out there. In fact, um, we've looked at some of the data within Experian, and we have got it off the dark web. And I'll use myself as an example. One, I didn't have to put in my social to find out that I do have data out there, but I had entries going back 25 years with my same social, different addresses, not complete phone number. So what I would recommend, go to a reputable site. Um, there is one out there called National Pen Test. Uh, you can do that. You don't have to provide your number. Uh, your social security number to go ahead and see if you might be impacted. All right. Any other uh, advice for uh, consumers, uh, for folks out there who are, are nervous uh, about this? Yes. Um, it's all about awareness, speed, and having layers of protection. So check your credit file. If you need to and feel like you need to place a 
a, a freeze on your file. That's also a good thing. Um, change your passwords for any financial accounts and use a second factor of authentication, particularly ones that might have social involved like government ID, your mortgage, and banks. And then you can always sign up for identity theft protection. Experian has identity works, but there's also a number of free services. And last but not least, you don't need to give up your social if it's asked for, especially if somebody says, hey, you need to do this to provide health care services or dental services. You don't have to do it. They're trying to track you down for payment, but hold on to that social or any unique identifier because it can be used um, to create uh, a new identity. That is very good advice. And uh, any other big uh, breaches lately that uh, that are top of mind and um, that you're hearing about uh, from uh, consumers of, of the biggest concern right now? Well, there, there's been some in the news. Um, last year, it was the Move It third-party secure fi- file transfer breach, which impacted uh, thousands of companies and tens of millions of individuals. Uh, AT&T has, uh, of course, been in the news. And then Ticketmaster, um, where over 100 million people were compromised worldwide. Uh, breaches aren't stopping, and uh, people should always take precautions early and it's better to be proactive be a chicken little and and be suspicious and that will serve you well when you're trying to protect your identity all right and now qr codes are, are very popular too uh, is, is there a, a risk of uh, of taking that uh, qr code on, on your phone uh, have you seen um, examples there where, where people are, are getting uh, scammed somehow Yes, we got used to the QR code as a matter of convenience and health and safety when the pandemic came around because you could click on the QR code to see the menu and that. But unfortunately, no human can determine if a QR code is legit or it's not. So I say stay away from QR codes. Don't click on any links and even don't answer any phone calls from people you're not suspecting uh, a call coming from because it only takes 10 seconds and they could make a voice print. It could be reproduced to use as a second factor authentication with your bank as an example. That is very important. So this technology is great when it works, right? But it can also backfire when it's used by criminals, especially on, on the voice verification, right? That That is true. And the one thing, getting back to second factor of authentication, to have just a username and password is one thing. You need to have long and complex passwords, but that second factor of authentication, whether it's a text to your phone, it's your facial recognition, or it might be a biometric thumbprint, those are uh, sure ways to keep the hackers not getting into your accounts and going to someone else. Ryan, we had that situation here uh, at a stadium where uh, this apparently was a a technical problem. The uh, the stadium um, ticket system uh, malfunctioned, uh, and um, and they're trying to get that straightened out in time for another event there uh, for the concert. But um, anything else that uh, you'd like to mention? I, I know Experian, of course, uh, a huge um, and important company here uh, related to all this. Uh, anything new uh, there at Experian? Any new uh, tools or anything else that we should know about? Well, there's a couple places at Experian where I direct your listeners. The first one is at Ask Experian Blogs which gives consumer tips how to protect yourself and what to do, in fact, if you think you suffered identity theft. And then the other place is www.experian.com forward slash data breach. Again, consumer tips, how to protect yourself, especially new scams that are coming out, like this is the peak of the end of travel season, as well as there's always the romance scam or or pig butchering that's going on, which is even worse, trying to steal your cryptocurrency, starting with a romance theme. So some great information out there for your listeners. So check it out. Terrific. Michael, thanks for taking the call this afternoon to wrap up the week. Michael Broomer, Vice President and Head of Experian Global Data Breach Resolution. Thanks for that terrific information and look forward to speaking with you again uh, as more of these situations come up. Have a great weekend. Same to you, Frank. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. And out to the freeways we go now on 790 KBC. 
Motec of Money continues here in 790 KBC. Good afternoon. New concerns about the nation's growing debt bomb. Today's the anniversary of the so-called Inflation Reduction Act that was passed a couple of years ago. Today, richest guy in the world, Elon Musk, tweeted or X'd out on his X, formerly known as Twitter platform. In his words, inflation is caused by the federal government spending more than it earns because they just print more money to make up the difference. To solve inflation, he wrote, reduce wasteful government spending. Your tax dollars should be spent well, not poorly. This at a time when we're told uh, inflation is supposedly easing. At the same time, the price of gold is hit a record high today, above $2,500 an ounce for the first time. Joining us live now is Kurt Couchman, Senior Fiscal Policy Fellow at Americans for Prosperity. Kurt, thanks very much for coming to the line this afternoon. Good afternoon, Frank. Thanks for having me on. All right. Yeah, tell us about this uh, big anniversary here today of the so-called Inflation Reduction Act. Remember at the time it happened, there were a lot of studies that said it was going to uh, cause inflation, not reduce it. Um, what, what's, uh, what do we need to know here two years later? Well, that's right. It's a long story, but uh, the short version of it is that the federal government piled up its debt burden especially during the two speakership periods of Nancy Pelosi, uh, one of your, your fellow Californians. And um, then with the, infl- with the American Rescue Plan Act in March 2021, which passed with only Democratic votes, that's when the Federal Reserve lost control of inflation. That became obviously a big problem for most Americans, and Congress felt the heat. So they had to name something big uh, in a way that would suggest that it would combat inflation. And that's what they claimed for the Inflation Reduction Act. That's not really what the legislation did. The the core of the bill was actually to do what they couldn't do in 2009 with cap and trade, which was to create a method of subsidizing all the green energy, the low carbon technologies um, that they're very, very keen on. And so that was really the point of the bill. But they used some games in terms of the, the Congressional Budget Office scoring. And it turns out that it's actually going to significantly increase the deficit over the next decade. And that puts pressure on inflation. It does not reduce inflation. It actually exacerbates the problems that led to inflation in the first place. Right. And over the last, uh, what, three, four years, we've seen uh, pretty significant inflation. Uh, I'm sure you've seen uh, some of these charts and uh, write-ups uh, on uh, on X and uh, and other uh, financial um places where uh, where they track this very, very closely, and, and you track it very, very closely. We, we've seen a dramatic rise uh, over the last several years. Yeah, that's right. Prices are up across the economy about 20%, and that doesn't even account for the, inter- the increased interest costs that we're having to pay because the Federal Reserve had to increase interest rates in order to keep inflation from being worse. In an ideal world, they would be reducing the money supply relative to the, the crazy highs that it was in, at the last couple of years by reducing their holdings of treasury debt, which they are doing, but not as fast as they should, because there's just so much uh, federal debt out there right now that the market is fairly saturated, and there would be concerns about trying to unload too much of that too quickly. We're on the air with Kurt Couchman, Senior Fiscal Policy Fellow at Americans for Prosperity. In the meantime, the the value of the dollar has come down. Uh, gold at an all-time high today. It's uh, above $2,500 an ounce here. What are your thoughts uh, about uh, the strength of the dollar at this point? Well, gold is a store of value, and if that's moving up relative to the dollar, then that would suggest that people are having concerns about holding the dollar as a store of value. And in fact, we're seeing uh, some of the proposals that are being kicked around for tariffs and price controls and even more subsidies that would add to the debt, um, giving investors pause about the long-term stability of the U.S. dollar. Uh, So U.S. dollar is the primary reserve currency for global trade, but if the federal government can't get its act together, then that status uh, could be very much threatened over the coming decades. All right, and we're in a uh, political season here right now. A big contrast between the two uh, candidates. Uh, Maybe you can size that up for us. Well, um, both have not been perfect, <laughs> but the uh, the latest proposals from Vice President Harris uh, were estimated by the nonpartisan Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget to add about two trillion dollars to the the debt over the next decade if the housing policies are made permanent. So there's uh, and they call it the silly season for a reason. There's a lot of promises of giveaways and that sort of thing. 
Um, but a $2 trillion uh, price tag for the first proposal coming out of the Harris campaign, uh, that's a cause for concern. But ultimately, Congress would have to pass that legislation. And right now, the budget process that Congress manages has a lot of problems. If they were to fix that, then it would make it a lot easier to push back on all of these proposals for giveaways that actually don't make economic sense and wouldn't do the things that are claimed uh, that they would do. We heard from Elon Musk today, who has uh, a lot of those dollars that are that are shrinking in value. Um, he wrote to solve inflation, uh, reduce wasteful government spending. Uh, your tax dollar should be spent well, not poorly. Any uh, progress uh, on that front that you see there in Washington at all? Well, people keep talking about it. I was a congressional staffer uh, from 2011 to 2016. Uh, that, that was during the whole Tea Party era. And um, people kept talking about it. There was some progress towards controlling waste and controlling spending. But the problem is fundamentally that the federal uh, budget process that Congress does only covers appropriations. That's only 26 percent of spending. So we need to have the other three quarters of spending and all of the revenue and all the spending through the tax code be part of the annual congressional budget so they can actually manage all of these things. Now, there actually is legislation to do that. And there's a bunch of other bills that uh, members have worked uh, to develop, and we've helped them with some of them. Um, And so these are ready. The next time there is a moment to start fixing the federal budgeting, um, these bills are on the shelf. They're ready to go. Most of them have bipartisan support, or or they should be able to pretty easily. So there is hope. We've got to change the system so we can change the incentives for members of Congress to do the tough but necessary stuff that right now just seems too politically uh, problematic for them. But there are, there are ways to make it possible for them to do that work. All right. Well, thanks very much for taking the call on this. Kurt Couchman, Senior Fiscal Policy Fellow at Americans for Prosperity, live with us here on Motec on Money on 790 KBC. Thank you very much uh, for joining us here this afternoon and recapping a pretty impressive week on Wall Street uh, following the nervous week we had last week, a nice rebound. In fact, the best week for the market we've seen since last November. The Dow coming in for a closing gain of 97 points, settling at 40,659. The S&P 500 up 11 at 5,554. And the NASDAQ gained 37 at 17,632. All the major averages in the plus column for the week. And gold is shining to close out the week, up nearly $54 at $2,546.20 an ounce, an all-time high for the price of gold. Stay tuned now for the 790 KBC News Blitz with Randy Wang, and I'll be back with more at 4 Monday afternoon here on Motec on Money, 790 KBC. Named one of the best personal finance podcasts, The Stacking Benjamin Show with Joe and his friends makes financial literacy fun. We see money inefficiency OG around us all the time. We've got a few skeletons sitting out in the open, and maybe we need to broom them into the closet, if you know what I mean. Nope, take that out. What, what is... <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you were going for, it didn't land right. Who's got a shovel and some lime? <laughs> Maybe you need to do that with your financial picture. I don't know. Find out more by searching the Stacking Benjamins podcast wherever you listen.